Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Welcome to Faith Matters with Philip Campbell, a Catholic variety program broadcasting on Good Shepherd Catholic Radio here in Jackson, Michigan. I am your host, Philip Campbell, and my friends, it is my pleasure to be back here behind the microphone again here on Faith Matters, especially because today we are going to talk about a very ancient discipline in the Catholic Church, and that is the practice of fasting. Now, no ascetic discipline is so universally recommended by the scriptures and by our tradition as the practice of fasting. And paradoxically, no practice is so universally neglected or misunderstood in modern Catholicism. If we go back to the scriptures from the tales of Abraham to the fasting of the Ninevites who averted the wrath of God by their penance, to the tale of Sarah who fasted before her wedding to Tobias, to the words of our Lord that certain demons could only be overcome by fasting, scripture is just full of these examples of the importance of fasting and its efficacy in purifying the soul and obtaining God's favor. And the lives of the saints could afford us with thousands more examples. But really, how, how necessary is fasting to the advancement of the spiritual life? How does it work? What fruits do we derive from the practice? What does the church teach about fasting? So I want to talk about these questions today in light of tradition, scripture, and the teachings of St. Robert Bellarmine, who has some really excellent insights on the subject of fasting. Now, what is fasting? Well, if we look at the church's canon law, canonically speaking, fasting is defined as only eating one meal on a given day and two small snacks, which together are not larger than the one meal, right? These are the rules we always have to revisit <laughs> coming up to Ash Wednesday and, uh, and Good Friday. Now, traditionally, this one meal that you would take during the day would be meatless as well. Now, under current law, fasting is only obligatory on Good Friday and Ash Wednesday, but it, this practice used to be much more widespread. In the early church, weekly fasts were practiced on Wednesdays and Fridays regularly. And in the early Middle Ages, the, uh, the practice of observing a prolonged period of fasting leading up to Easter became common, what we now call the period of Lent. Incidentally, if you've ever wondered what the word Lent means, it's a contraction of the old English word lengthen, which means spring season. And if you think that lengthen sounds like lengthen, you're right, because spring is the time of year when the days begin to lengthen. Now, there also used to be four sets of days throughout the year called ember days, which were set apart for fasting and abstinence. We're going to talk about the ember days a little later. Abstinence, just to make sure we're understanding things correctly, means abstaining from meat in particular. And of course, there also developed the practice of fasting from all food several hours before receiving the Eucharist. And this has found its way into the English language in the word breakfast. You've probably noticed the word breakfast literally is composed of two words, break fast, to break the fast. Because traditionally, Catholics would receive Holy Communion in the morning and they'd fast before that, and then they would break their fast after, uh, after Mass in the late morning. So breakfast or break fast is what you'd eat after Holy Communion. But I'm not so much interested about the relatively minimal amount of mandatory fasting that's called for by the Church's canon law today, but rather the art of fasting as a voluntary uh, penance, as a work of asceticism that we take upon ourselves when we're praying about something or when we're trying to overcome a certain sin. Now, I think the first question we should ask is how important is fasting? Is it a precept that we are expected to do? Is it just a counsel? Is it something that our Lord advises us? You know, if you want to be perfect, do this, but you don't actually have to. Now, of course, as I said, we're not speaking of those days of fasting and abstinence that are mandated by canon law. Everybody has to fast and abstain on Good Friday, for example, if you want to be a Catholic in good standing. Rather, we're talking about the practice of fasting as a form of spiritual asceticism. Is this sort of fasting a practice that is merely counseled, or is it, uh, is it commanded such that it's a necessity for the spiritual life? Now, it's a very interesting fact that the earliest church fathers, uh, going way back in Christian history, 
they are much more interested in telling Christians when they should not fast than mandating when they should. For example, if we look at the ancient manual, the Didache, which was written way back around 70 AD, the Didache instructs Christians to avoid fasting on the same day as the Jews. It says that the Jews fast on Mondays and Tuesdays, but you, your fast should not coincide with them. You should fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Now, the purpose of this was because the early Christian community was eager to distinguish itself from Judaism by not holding communal fasts on the same days as the Jews. So the earliest teaching on when Christians are to fast was determined by a way of negation. But in ruling out certain days of the week, the Didache does in fact imply that Christians were expected to fast. This early tradition lived on in the practice of observing fasting during the Ember Days, which we mentioned earlier. Now, the Ember Days refers to three days set apart for fasting, abstinence, and prayer during each of the four seasons of the year. So you'd have three days of fasting that were observed four times throughout the year. The purpose of the Ember Days was to thank God for the gifts of nature, to teach us to make use of them in moderation and to spend the day devoting ourselves to pious works like assisting the needy and so on. The Ember Days are Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday after the first Sunday of Lent, that's for the spring, then after Pentecost Sunday for the summer, after the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, which is September 14th for the autumn, and then after the third Sunday of Advent for the winter. And so these three sets of fasting days were observed seasonally as a way to sanctify the seasons or the changing of the seasons. And of course, the implication of even having such days as the Ember Days is that Christians are fasting or that they're supposed to be fasting. Now, our Lord Jesus himself implied the same thing. And like we saw in the Didache, Jesus did so in the context of contrasting the fasting of a Christian with the fasting of the Pharisees. He tells his followers, quote, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now notice Jesus's attitude there. By the way, that's Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. Jesus simply takes it for granted that Christians are going to fast. He doesn't think it's necessary to establish the point. He goes right on to discuss the manner in which Christians ought to fast. He does not say if you fast, but when you fast. Now, given the attitude of our Lord, and the words of the Didache and other Christian writings on the subject, all of which presume that Christians are fasting, and all the examples of fasting afforded us by the Old and New Testaments and the lives of the saints, it seems safe to say that fasting is a very integral part of the spiritual life for any serious Christian. Or to put it another way, if you want to grow in your spiritual life, you should consider voluntary fasting over and above the, the, the relatively few canonical fasts that are prescribed by the church today. Now, I want to stop short of, of stating that, you know, that fasting is a strict, that this sort of fasting is a strict precept, and as if those who fail to fast beyond the prescribed times of year are guilty of some sin or are going to be damned for not fasting. Remember, we're talking about fasting above and beyond uh, Good Friday and, uh, and Ash Wednesday. So, I don't want to make it seem like it's an absolute necessity, but it is, it is very integral. It's, it's a necessity maybe in the same way that reading the scriptures is, is a necessity. Certainly anyone who's serious about getting to heaven and wants to advance their spiritual life is going to read the scriptures. It says in the Catechism, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And those who positively refuse to read the scripture may be endangering their soul. Even so, one could not say that reading the Bible is strictly necessary for salvation since people can go to heaven who have not or cannot read the scriptures. Fasting seems to be in this general category. It's not strictly necessary to go above and beyond the church's fast days, uh, 
But you do jeopardize the resilience of your soul against sin and temptation if you just positively refuse to ever fast. So for all practical purposes, the scriptures and our tradition teach us that fasting is something we should take very seriously and that it's a, it's an integral part of the spiritual life of a Christian who's really trying to grow in holiness. Now, the reason fasting is so integral is because its fruits are so manifold, such that it becomes really an indispensable aid on the journey to sanctity. St. John Chrysostom summarizes the importance of fasting quite succinctly when he tells us, quote, fasting is the support of our soul. It gives us wings to ascend on high and to enjoy the highest contemplation. That quote is from his first homily on Genesis. But let us look at the five fruits of fasting according to St. Robert Bellarmine. Robert Bellarmine was the most prominent theologian of the 16th and 17th centuries and probably one of the greatest scriptural exegetes the church ever produced. And there is a, there is a publishing house that's dedicated to, to uh, publishing the works of Robert Bellarmine. It's called Mediatrix Press. It has a lot of original, never-before-printed English translations of Bellarmine's work. I can't recommend them highly enough. But I'm going to turn to a book by Sophia Press, um, that has, uh, Sophia Press has published one of his treatises called The Art of Dying Well. In this book, St. Robert gives us five benefits of fasting, which I'd like to summarize. Number one, fasting disposes your soul for prayer. In order to pray effectively, we have to set our mind on things heavenly and pull our attentions and affections away from things that are merely earthly, things that drag our minds and our hearts down and serve as a barrier to contemplating divine things. Remember, the definition of something sacred or holy is that it's set apart, set apart for God's use. Fasting aids us in detaching our attentions from merely temporal things and allows us to more effectually communicate with God. Now, if you go back to the Bible, Moses fasted 40 days in preparation for his encounter with God on Mount Sinai. Elijah fasted for 40 days. Daniel fasted for three weeks before receiving the series of visions that we read in the second book of Daniel. Jesus himself fasted for 40 days as he prepared himself for his mission in the wilderness. And St. Francis of Assisi spent a month in fasting and prayer prior to receiving the Holy Stigmata. And in the church's liturgy, great feasts are traditionally preceded by periods of fasting. For it's evident from the examples of the scriptures and the lives of the saints that we are simply better disposed to pray effectually when in a state of fasting. So, number one, fasting disposes the soul for prayer. Number two, fasting tames the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, St. Paul tells us to crucify the flesh with its vices and concupiscences. And elsewhere, he offers himself as an example, saying, quote, I chastise my body to bring it into subjection. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, the body is certainly not evil, as some heresies have taught. It's created by God. It's good. But it nevertheless can become a distraction in the service of God because we have all these bodily urges and passions that attempt to bend our will towards gratifying them at whatever cost, even if it's sinful. There's many bodily desires, But perhaps the most primal and fundamental bodily desire is the desire to eat, that Bellarmine says. Hunger is experienced by all persons of both sexes, of all ages, of every state in life. It is the fundamental bodily urge. And hunger is the most indicative of our creaturely state and our contingent existence, says St. Robert. It is king of all bodily desires. Therefore, when we fast, it's like we dethrone this king, and we force the urges of hunger to submit to the will. And if we can do this, we progress greatly in taming the flesh and subjecting it to our reason. St. Robert says there's no means of subjecting the flesh that is more effectual than fasting. Fasting tames the flesh. The third benefit of fasting, it honors God. Fasting gives honor and glory to God because we ourselves, by training ourselves in asceticism, become living sacrifices that are pleasing to God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, St. Paul tells us, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. 
This is why the Council of Nicaea called the Lenten fast a clean and solemn gift offered by the Church to God. And none other than Pope St. Leo the Great also calls fasting a sacrifice. He says, The sure reception of all its fruits, the sacrifice of abstinence, is most worthily offered to God, the giver of them all. And so St. Robert says, Therefore, fasting is a sacrifice that gives honor and glory to God. Now, besides this, going on to the fourth point, fasting is also penitential. It's a means of doing penance. Now, when we do penance, we are helping to redress the disorders caused by sin. This is related to what was said above regarding hunger as king of the bodily desires. Because we're in the flesh, we all need food for nourishment. And the practice of fasting becomes a little bit unpleasant. It's, it's hard on those days, on Good Friday, when you have to only do one meal, it's like, oh, <laughs> like we act like it's the worst thing in the world, right? It's, it's unpleasant. It requires the virtue of fortitude to do it consistently. And so it becomes an act of penance, an act that we can offer to God. And the scriptures and the fathers give us many examples of this. Remember in the story of Jonah, the people of Nineveh fasted at Jonah's preaching and averted the wrath of God. And the Jews in the days of Esther appeased God by prayer and fasting. There's many other citations from the Church Fathers that could be offered in support of this, but we'll just wrap this up with two. St. Cyprian of Carthage admonished his people, quote, Let us appease God by fasting and weeping as he admonishes us. And St. Augustine also says, quote, No one fasts for human praise, but for the pardon of his sins, end quote. So fasting is penitential. It's one of the classic acts of penance, and we should keep that in mind when we're doing penance, especially during Lent, but any time of the year or any time that we're looking to do penance or ramp up our spiritual life. Finally, fasting is meritorious with God, both in the sense that it's effective in obtaining favors from God and in that fasting itself merits a divine reward. In the Old Testament, Hannah fasted and her prayers were heard by God because of her fasting, and thus she conceived the prophet Samuel, as we're told in the book of 1 Samuel. And similarly, in the book of Tobit, Sarah was delivered from a demon after fasting for three days. Now, our Lord warns us that certain demons can only be overcome by fasting. And if we return to the passage in the Gospel of Matthew we spoke of earlier, we note that our Lord promises a reward for those who fast. He says, quote, But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but your Father, who is in the secret place, Your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So fasting assists us in obtaining God's assistance in our temporal affairs and also obtaining our eternal reward. So now that we've examined the necessity of fasting and the fruits we derive from the practice, it's time to ask ourselves how we actually go about doing it. In this, we will take as our guides the words of the prophet Isaiah and again the teachings of St. Robert Bellarmine. In the book of Isaiah, the Israelites are complaining. Uh, That's a very common theme in the Old Testament. Um, They're complaining. They say, despite fasting in accordance with God's rules, their prayers are not being heard, and they seemingly derive no benefit from fasting. They say, why do we fast, and why do you not see it? We afflict ourselves, and you take no notice of it. This is Isaiah 58. Now, God's response through Isaiah is very telling about the proper way to handle fasting. In the following verses, God warns them that their fasts are unacceptable for a multitude of reasons. Let's look at his response. We're in Isaiah 58, verses 4 through 7. God says, Lo, on your fast day, you carry about your own pursuits, and you drive all your laborers. Yes, your fast ends in quarreling and fighting and striking each other with wicked claw. Would that today you might fast so as to make your voice heard on high. Is this the manner of fasting I wish, of keeping a day of penance, that a man bow his head like a reed and lie in sackcloth and ashes? Do you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? This, rather, is the fasting that I wish. Release those bound unjustly, untie the thongs of the yoke, set free the oppressed, breaking every yoke, sharing your bread with the hungry, sheltering the oppressed and the homeless, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your own. End quote. So, in the first place, though food has been given up, God notes that they have not given up quarreling and fighting. Uh, 
The lesson here is that the purpose of fasting, remember, it's to mortify the flesh. It makes no sense to give up food but not wickedness. Fasting from food is only a means to an end. The end is to overcome sin. St. Basil the Great says, quote, Let us fast an acceptable and very pleasing fast to the Lord. The true fast is the estrangement from evil, temperance of the tongue, abstinence from anger, separation from desires, slander, falsehood, and perjury. Privation of these is true fasting, end quote. So in other words, the flesh cannot be mortified if we deny it in one manner but gratify it in three others. So the practice of fasting must go hand in hand with a general disposition of humility and penitence that should accompany all our actions, even those not strictly related to our fast. St. Robert Bellarmine says the same thing, quote, Nor do they derive any fruit who, although they may eat more moderately, yet on fasting days do not abstain from games, parties, quarrels, dissensions, lascivious songs, and immoderate laughter, and what is worse, commit the same crimes as they would on ordinary days. In other words, they fast, they deprive themselves of some food, but they continue doing all these uh, doing all these sinful things that they normally would have done, and it, it, it makes the fasting of no benefit. Now, God chastises the Israelites for the same reason Jesus does in his woes against the Pharisees. He says they bend the head and they lie in sackcloth and ashes so that it looks like they're fasting, but what is true fasting? God says that this ought to be accompanied by doing works of charity, clothing the naked, setting free the oppressed, and so on. And what's more, our Lord adds that this ought to be done with a clean appearance and a fresh countenance so it's not readily apparent that we are fasting. Even if you don't decide to do any additional fasting, you know, this year, when you do do your fasting during Lent, think about that before you complain, you know, about, uh, oh, how's your Good Friday doing? Oh, I'm so hungry. (laughs) You know, our Lord says we're not supposed to go about making it evident that we are fasting. We're supposed to go around with a fresh countenance and washed face and keep the fasting between ourselves and God. Now, finally, because people are very cognizant of this sort of thing these days, I feel we must mention this here. This kind of fasting that we're exploring in this program, it's a spiritual practice whose aims are are spiritual. It's the purpose of this is to mortify, mortify the flesh, to draw closer to the Lord, to persevere in holiness, to grow in prayer and grace, and so on. However, if you struggle with something like an eating disorder, or body image problems, or you have dietary issues, or anything like this where uh, such that the practice of fasting would constitute a danger for you, then by all means, you really need to consult a priest about alternate methods of penance that are more suitable to your specific condition. Uh, God wants us to do penance, but he wants us to be cognizant of our own safety as well. And if you're the sort of person who has had problems like this, then then fasting probably isn't what you should be doing. There's many other things we can abstain from other than food. For many of us, it might be a harder penance for me to abstain from my cell phone for a day than to abstain from two meals, right? I'm, I'm sure there's many of you listening who are in this uh, this category too, you're going without food. I mean, think about this. You're, you're going without food for a few hours, and you think, ah, you know, I'll, it's only lunchtime's two hours away. I'll, I'll just get, get food at lunch. But if you can't find your cell phone, it's like, we can do nothing until I find my cell Where is the cell phone? I have, to, I have to backtrack until I find it right now. Everything else has to stop. So there's other things we can abstain from other than food that practically have a similar benefit if you struggle with an eating disorder or dietary problems or something like that, of course. So, you know, you obviously should consult a priest about something like that. But assuming you don't have any of those issues, then it behooves us to at least consider this age-old practice that is so universally commended by the saints, practiced both in Bible times, Old and New Testaments, by all the greatest figures of salvation history, and on into the church age throughout the church's many ages up until today. If God himself tells us that it's so meritorious and that it bears so many good fruits, perhaps it's the answer, or at least part of the answer, to the manifold problems in our church and world today.
So these are all some things to consider, my friends, especially if as we're moving into uh, the church's penitential seasons throughout the cycle of the liturgical year, fasting, is there things we can do over and above what is merely required? So pray about that, my friends. But that is about all the time we have today on Faith Matters. Thank you for joining me. I am Philip Campbell, and until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Farewell, my friends.